Boyd, thank you for taking the time to do this today. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. So Boyd is professor as a professor to the University of Alberta um, in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Nutrition. Um, actually relatively new there. August 2019 was when you started and you came from UXA. So maybe I'll let you do the rest of your introduction and then we can, we can get into uh, the presentation. Sure, sounds good. Well, that was pretty much it. I was formerly at AAFC in Saskatoon. Uh, started my research program at the U of A August last year. Um, of course, it's been impacted a little bit, uh, like the rest of you, by COVID. Um, but we have some projects that are just getting off the ground this year. Um, and my research is supported by Alberta wheat, barley, canola, and pulse. So, and I'll, of course, today, uh, being in Alberta, wheat and barley webinar that's going to be the focus of my talk but uh, I'll, I'm happy if people have other questions um, later on I can try to address those as well perfect oh I should also say that yeah you mentioned that Brienne pre-recorded because of a little one I also have two little ones and I thought of that last night and was like oh hopefully they're not too loud today um, but uh, I've been told that they're going to be trying to stay on the other side of the house so uh, Hopefully they, you don't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you share your screen, we can, uh, we can get going. All right. Let's get the right one. Okay. Can you guys see that all right? Yep. <clears throat> all right. Okay. Fantastic. Um, let me just do one other thing. Ooh, fancy. Can you see the laser pointer? Cool. All right. So um, thank you for the invitation to give this webinar today. Um, hopefully it'll be about half an hour long. Um, and I just want to point out that Shelley Barkley, uh, who's the uh, insect survey technologist here in Alberta, and Megan Van Kosky, who's a research scientist who leads the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, are, are co-authors on this talk because a lot of it's based off of uh, work they do uh, in terms of surveying and monitoring for these uh, insect pests. Um, so I really want to stress uh, two kind of major insect pest surveillance uh, networks that we have. Um, in Alberta, of course, we have the Alberta Insect Pest Monitoring Network, uh, which was formerly headed up by Scott Mears, uh, who has uh, just retired this past uh, February, early February, late January, early February. Um, and now it's led by uh, the wonderful Shelley Barkley. Um, and who uh, I hope you guys are all familiar with. Um, she's very active uh, in the field and, and on Twitter. Um, so if you have questions, uh, she is a great person to reach out to. Um, and definitely uh, put out a Google search or do a Google search and search for the Alberta Insect Pest Monitoring Network. Lots of great resources, and many of which I'm going to highlight and, and talk about today. Um, also, I wanted to talk about the, pardon me, the Prairie Brewing Network. Um, so this is a prairie-wide network led by Megan, Dr. Megan Mankoski and Jennifer Otani. Um, Megan is based out of AFC in Saskatoon, um, and Jennifer is based out of AFC in up in Beaver Lodge. And so the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network kind of acts as overall coordinators um, for some of our major crop species, um, and they work with Shelly here in Alberta. They work with Jim Tanzi, the Provincial Insect Specialist in Saskatchewan, and John Kowalski, the Provincial Insect Specialist uh, in, in Manitoba. And so they all, they all work together on their surveys, and uh, each year they develop uh, forecasts and, um, and risk maps, uh, and many of which I'll highlight. So if you're not familiar with these two uh, networks, here are a couple web addresses to check out, but also if you just Google them, uh, it'll be just as quick. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, of course, because this is uh, Alberta wheat and barley uh, webinar, those, that's going to be the focus of the insect pests that I talk about today. Um, and we're going to kick it off with some forecasts. And you probably, you may have seen these forecasts. Uh, they've been available now for, for a few months, uh, but we'll go through them and just kind of give you some highlights from each. And the first, of course, is grasshoppers. Um, depending on your region, you may have been plagued by them last year. Uh, we have several different uh, kind of crop, what we would consider our crop spe pest species. Um, we have the two stripes, uh, packards, 
migratory clear wing and bruners. I'm going to talk a little bit about bruners today. Uh, you may have heard this story before, but I, I, I think it's a good one and, and needs to be highlighted. Um, and then, which so bruners is mainly a pest in kind of north central Alberta and, and in the Peace region. Um, that's kind of our dominant pest in that region. And then depending on our other regions, we can have a, a combination of these uh, other species. So just to bring you back, and I'm sure most of you know this, but our grasshoppers here, they overwinter as eggs. Uh, those eggs hatch early in the spring into nymphs, and those nymphs, of course, start feeding. Uh, and they go through several different nymphal stages. And of course, it's the large ones, the large nymphs and the adults that are gonna do the most damage. So every year uh, in Alberta, in, um, in August, they do a grasshopper survey and they look at the number of adults in uh, a meter squared. Uh, and this is run by the agricultural, or this is done by the agricultural fieldmen here in Alberta. And from that data, they develop a, a forecast. And so I'm just gonna run you through a couple of the forecast maps from previous years. Uh, so this was the 2017 forecast. Down here, I just want to highlight that you can see, this is the um, forecast for 2017, but the grasshoppers were surveyed in August of the previous year, so August of 2016. And of course, going from green being very low or no risk to red, very severe risk, you can see the risk was a lot higher uh, in, in 2017, down in Southern Alberta, and there was forecasted to be a lot less risk up in uh, uh, North Central Alberta and the Peace region. And then just to throw up a few more maps, we have 2018 and 2019. And so these were the forecasts. And you can see in 2018, we ended up having, or the forecast was for pretty significant populations of grasshoppers up in the North Central region and up in the Peace region. Whereas in 2019, we, we see those populations, the forecast was lower in the north central region and in, uh, in southern Alberta it was, it was a bit higher. And for 2020 this is what it looks like. This is the forecast. So again this is based off of last year grasshopper counts. Um, and so you can see down in southern Alberta we have uh, a severe, very severe forecast for grasshoppers in certain areas. Um, and then in the north central region and the peace region we also have um, kind of a higher risk of grasshopper uh, severity in this region, uh, forecasted for this region. But this is where the interesting stuff is going on um, in this North Central and this Peace region. This is where I said we have that dominant species, that Melanopolis bruneri or Bruner spur throated grasshopper. And if we look over the years, um, oh yes, and I just want to point out that um, Dr. Dan Johnson at the University of Lethbridge is currently researching this species and uh, and it's interesting life cycle. So we actually think that this species might be on a two year life cycle. And I'm just gonna highlight that with these maps here if we look at these forecasts from 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020. And you can see um, Southern Alberta, these populations, th these are not the Bruneri grasshoppers. You can see that they kind of are consistent across the years. Whereas in the North, Cent North Central Alberta and the Peace region, we see kind of this population increase every two years. So we see high levels and high level forecasted for 2018 and a high level forecasted for 2020. But I just want to remind you that this is actually based off of data that was collected the year before. So if we look at the 2018 forecast, this was actually 2017 grasshopper populations. So you can see that in 2017, we had high levels of grasshoppers in this region. 2019, those of you from the piece, you'll remember that we had high levels of grasshoppers in this region. And of course, it was last year's populations that are forecasted, that are used to forecast for next year. So what we're hoping is that this, this forecast for the Peace region in North Central, where we think or what we believe um, will actually be incorrect because Bruners is the dominant species up there and we believe it's on this two-year cycle. So even though if you look at this map, 2020 is supposed to be forecasted to be a high level of grasshoppers up in the Peace in the North Central region, um, we believe that it will actually probably, hopefully be a low uh, level of grasshoppers this year. And we'll see if that, if that actually pans out. Um, and that's part of what Dan Johnson at the University of Lethbridge is, is researching. And I just wanna stress that this is only in 
the peace in North Central Alberta. Southern Alberta, we're still seeing this annual cycle of, of grasshoppers, which holds true uh, fairly well across, across the seasons. Okay, um, so that's it for grasshoppers. Uh, next, I want to talk about wheat midge. Or do you had a, we had a quick question actually from Haley Cat, and I figured I'd throw it out there before sure. we jump into to wheat midge. Uh, she asked, is the grasshopper forecast for all grasshopper species together? Um, so it is predominant. So yes, I'll say yes. Um, it depends on the region. The modeling that's done by the Prairie Pest Net Monitoring Network is based off of um, the uh, migratory grasshopper, but the forecast is, is includes multiple species. Okay. Um, so now on to wheat midge. Um, so wheat midge, just to draw your attention to its life cycle, it overwinters uh, and in a cocoon as a late instar, second instar larvae. Um, in the spring with adequate moisture in May, the larvae will continue their development and they'll pupate and then we usually get emergence timed with about anthesis um, in, in our wheat crop. And of course that allows the females to lay eggs directly on the developing kernels and then those larvae uh, feed on those kernels. Later in the summer, once they're finished their development, they jump or pop off the plant, drop off the plant, and they then form a cocoon and overwinter. And so the reason I just wanted to reiterate its life cycle is that the survey that's conducted for the forecast is based off of overwintering cocoons. So soil samples are taken in, in wheat fields. Uh, Shelly will then wash them uh, and, and she will collect the cocoons and then will actually dissect the cocoons look at the number of viable, so those larvae that are alive and also that aren't parasitized. And that is what the forecast is, is based off of. And um, over the years, some, some really great research has been done that shows uh, that the number of viable cocoons uh, is a really good predictor of uh, populations uh, the following season. So to throw up uh, some maps here, Here's the 2017 wheat midge forecast. Again, this is based off of um, cocoons. So this is gonna be the number of midge per meter squared of, of soil surveyed here. Uh, and you can see that red is basically greater than 1800 midge cocoons per meter squared of soil. Um, so that's the 2017 forecast. There's 2018 and 2019. And wheat midge really are highly dependent on, on moisture. And you know, these last few years, it has been um, fairly dry and of course until later uh, in the season last year. And what we found for the 2020 or what's forecasted for 2020 is kind of this hot spot down south, um, southwest of Lloydminster, southeast of Edmonton. Uh, we have this one kind of region, but other than that, um, there are low levels of, of, um, of cocoons found throughout uh, Alberta. Now I want to draw your attention to uh, a resource available to you during the season. So coming up this season, um, there's collaborators with Alberta Insect Pest Monitoring Network who run wheat midge pheromone traps. And I've called this the wheat midge trap map. Uh, it's got a good rhyme to it. Uh, it uh, is available if you go to this website here, if you just Google uh, wheat, the wheat midge survey uh, in Alberta. Um, and it's basically, it's a Google map, it's a live map, and each week when um, agronomists or producers or who's ever running the trap go out and check it, they'll then enter in their data and it'll pop up as one of these little balloons on the map. And so of course right now, there's time of year, we're not trapping wheat midge, um, so there's nothing up on the map. Um, but later on in the season, uh, there, there's balloons that'll start being populated on the map, and you can go on here and you can check out the rating in your region. Unfortunately, right now, um, we kind of have these arbitrary levels of low, medium, and high risk. Uh, we, can't, we don't know exactly the numbers of midge that we catch or capture in traps and what that will relate to in the field. But at least this can give you an indication of what's happening in your field and um, that you should be out there scouting for midge. So you have to be out there manually scouting for midge. Um, and if you've never done this before, if you want to, um, 
if you want to uh, rehash how you scout for wheat midge, definitely go to the Alberta Insect Pest Monitoring Network. Um, Scott and Shelley have some videos up there uh, that show you how to set up a wheat midge pheromone trap, but also how to scout for wheat midge in your field. And definitely pay attention to this map during the season because um, you'll see as wheat midge are starting to pop up in different areas. Okay. So that's it on wheat midge. Next, I'm going to move on to wheat stem sawfly. So with wheat stem sawfly, <clears throat> this is a very kind of regional pest here in Alberta, uh, but a little bit on its life cycle, again, just to demonstrate how the, the survey and the forecast is conducted. So the larvae overwinter in, um, in the stem, lower down in the base of the stem, uh, and then in the spring, or pardon me, uh, yeah, and then in the spring they will, they'll, pardon me, they'll pupate in that stem, they'll emerge as adults, the females will find uh, new wheat or another host to lay their egg in, and then those larvae develop right in the pith of that stem. Later in the season they move down the stem, they kind of cut around on the inside of the stem, and that's what makes it really prone to lodging. And so the wheat stem softline map for the survey um, is cut, is um, is based off of cut stems uh, counted in the fall of the preceding year, okay? And then so, and then it's put together and you get this. So percent cut stems per field, and this is in a, a meter uh, squared area again. And you can see we really do have a hot spot here, kind of uh, in, on the western edge, uh, down in southern Alberta, and then of course down Towards, towards the border. And so this definitely does seem to be increasing. Um, and so hopefully if you were in one of these zones, in one of these regions, um, you would have saw this map earlier. And when you were making uh, seed choices, you'd be looking to grow a, uh, a semi-solid variety, which are tolerant, more tolerant to wheat midge, uh, pardon me, to wheat stem soft lot. Okay, all right, so, uh, um, that's all I have on, on wheat stem sawfly, all right? And just to point out in this map, I should say that these, the black dots in this map are areas that were surveyed, but no cut stems uh, or no, no damage was found. Okay, and so of course, now this is the, the early season. We just, you know, a lot of, well, not a lot. Some people are done uh, with their seeding. And so what's gonna happen right now? What are some of the things we should be on the lookout for? And of course, uh, one thing that came up in Alberta bug chat today was cutworms. Um, and so there's a variety of cutworm species. Um, some overwinter as eggs, some overwinter as late uh, or, or fairly large larvae. Uh, so red back and, and pale western, I believe overwinter as eggs. So right now these ones would be pretty small, uh, whereas these other ones uh, overwinter as, as larvae. So these ones would be pretty, pretty big. Um, they are fairly uh, generalists, but um, Ronald Batias and Maya Evenden at the University of Alberta uh, did some work looking at, at, at choices and host plant choice. Um, and larvae do have, do have choices, but it's really the female, you know, when the female is ovipositing and laying her eggs, um, those larvae are gonna stick to close to where um, those eggs were laid and whatever crop is gonna be in there uh, and feeding on it. So, <clears throat> These are something you should be on the lookout for right now. There's, there's slight differences between all of these, you know, depending on some actually cut the stem, some climb up the plant and feed on fo foliage. So we really, uh, it depends on this, what species you're dealing with. Um, and I'm going to point out a great resource to you in a couple of seconds uh, about, uh, of, to learn more about cutworms and which ones you're dealing with. But this is definitely something early in the season we, we want to be uh, on lookout for. And one thing I, I wanted to just shout out about is that uh, there's a potential misidentification um, with this right here. And this, is, this isn't a cutworm. This is actually a tapulid or a crane, a crane fly, or some people call them leather jacket larvae. And so this is a fly larvae, so you'll notice a few things about it. Um, it doesn't have legs. So here is a real cutworm down at the bottom. Here is our tapulid uh, fly larvae. So if you find these in the field, if you look at it, it doesn't have legs compared to our cutworm. Cutworm has three pairs of legs on what we on its thorax, and it also has these prolegs. 
Uh, a tapulid larvae also has little projections. You can see one kind of right here uh, coming off the tip of their, uh, their abdomen or at the end of their body. And they also generally don't curl up. You know, cutworms, they can curl up into a little ball. Um, tapulid larvae generally don't curl up into a ball. So that's just something that kind of pops up from year to year. People ask questions about that. Um, and that's just one thing to draw your attention to. You can also look at the head capsule. We don't really have a, a, a very large or well-defined head capsule in the tapulid larvae compared to a, a cutworm larvae where you can see the nice big head capsule there. And some resources to draw your attention to. So in Alberta, there's a cutworm reporting guide. Um, I took this before. There's actually uh, one little balloon that's popped up on this on this map now. It's not a cutworm, but uh, I took this picture before that was on there. So this again is a live in-season map. Um, and so during the season, as people find cutworms, they're asked to to enter it into this map and you could come to this map and see what's been found in your region. Okay, so definitely check that out. And if you do find cutworms, please um, report them here um, for other, to help out others. And another great resource that I really wanna draw your attention to is the cutworm field guide. Um, so this goes through basically all of our uh, major cutworm species and, and more. Um, go, it has really nice pages, really nice pictures, talks about you know, their distribution, their life cycle, how we can identify them, what part of the plants they feed on, when they will be larvae, when they will be eggs, etc. So definitely if you haven't seen the, the cutworm uh, field guide, check it out. You can download it for free at that website there. If you just Google the cutworm field guide, um, it'll, it'll come up. So check that one out. Another early season uh, pests that we want to be thinking about are wireworms. And I really need to thank uh, Haley, who's, who's listening into this webinar for this information and, and for this, the pictures provided here. So <clears throat> wireworms, uh, they can be pests in multiple crops. Uh, they are the larvae of click beetles. So if you're not familiar with click beetles, um, they, they get their name if you flip the beetle over they will actually make a clicking sound when they pop themselves back up um, and that's where they get their common name from so the adults you'll find out around around now i've seen a few um, lately the eggs are laid in the spring um, they can live for a very long time two to seven years underground um, they feed again on most crops um, especially down especially in cereals and other root crops and unfortunately, currently, they're not killed by our current pesticides. Um, so they are suppressed with some of our, with some of our neonic seed treatments, but that does not kill them. Um, and I have been told there are a few new products coming through the pipeline, uh, one of which uh, supposedly kills them. And, uh, we will see, uh, I believe it's supposed to be released in 2021. Um, and so hopefully uh, that'll give producers uh, a way to actually um, manage and, and kill um, wireworms in their fields. So there's a variety of species. Most of them here on the prairies are, are native. And there's three to five prominent species and they can differ in size. Quite Some are quite large, some are very small. Um, and you might think, you know, a small, uh, a small wireworm is just a baby or a young wireworm, but it could actually be a different species. Um, so they do come in various uh, sizes. And so here's Haley uh, out surveying a field. And, um, <clears throat> and you can see this, this wireworm damage and you can see the wireworm here feeding, feeding on this crop. And I really wanna point out that Haley is developing a wireworm field guide. Um, and so this will hopefully be coming out this fall. Uh, and this will be a fantastic resource uh, for us, uh, for agronomists and, other, and for growers. Um, to really help with their wireworms and wireworm issues. Here's one uh, potential misidentification. This is one I learned about recently. Uh, and this is not a, a, a wireworm. It's actually a stiletto fly larvae. Um, so help, to help ident identify it from a wireworm, if you look at it, it's, again, it's a fly larvae. It does not have a legs, pardon me, compared to a wireworm doesn't have projections at the end of its body. So here is an actual wireworm. You can see projections. This is the end of its body. Um, and in this stiletto fly larvae actually moves very quickly. Um, Laurel Thompson 
uh, from Lakeland had a, had a good video on, on Twitter a couple weeks ago now, uh, which I actually got the identification wrong, but thanks to uh, Haley and, uh, and Shelly, we, we got it right. And so this is a potential misidentification for a wireworm during the growing season. Hi, Boyd. It's, Brian. There's a couple of questions in the chat room maybe you could address now since you're on the topic. Sure. Uh, one is from Madison Boone. Is there data on wireworm populations in the Peace region? Uh, are, is, there, are, is there something that they should be concerned about? Mm. I am not aware of that. Um, I know Wim Van Herc, who's with AFC in Lethbridge, and um, Bob Vernon, who, or not Lethbridge, sorry, in Agassi in British Columbia, and Bob Vernon, who is in AFC, formerly in AFC in, um, in Agassi, have, have conducted uh, large surveys over the years. Um, but I am not aware of what was found in the piece. That would be a good question for Haley, and maybe Haley would be willing to step in and answer that uh, later. Uh, Haley says, no abundant survey of wireworms. Okay. There we go. And there's another question from uh, Brianne Tideman. Uh, what should you watch for in the field when scouting uh, to suggest that there might be cutworm feeding? Good question. So, um, of course, bear patches um, are, would make it kind of obvious. Um, from a distance, if you see a lot of birds flying above certain areas of your fields, that can be an indication of cutworms, could be potentially wireworms or something else um, to take a look at. Um, if you're out in the field uh, and, you're, uh, and you look down a row, cutworms like to move down rows. So if you see several plants in a row that have been taken out or don't look quite right, they might not actually be taken out, but just look slightly damaged. Um, definitely look at them. Um, cutworms are primarily uh, nighttime feeders. So if you're out during the day, you're gonna have to dig around, root around um, by the base of the plant uh, in the soil. Uh, if it's very hot, they can actually be up to, you know, eight to 10 centimeters deep in the soil. Um, so you're gonna wanna be digging around and looking for them. Good, thanks. Good. I'll let All you right. continue. Just okay. wanted to address those questions now. All right, there's just a couple more, couple more slides left. Um, let's see. Okay. So now I just wanted to highlight some resources that I hope you're familiar with. And if you're not that I think you should become, uh, familiar with. Um, so of course, as mentioned, there's the Alberta insect pest monitoring network, and I can't stress this enough here in Alberta, you should really be following this, this network. Um, so not only do they have in season maps for cutworm reporting, um, for wheat midge reporting, they also have for other crops like uh, canola, they have diamondback moth, uh, live in-season reporting, as well as birth armyworm reporting. So definitely check that out. Lots of good information there. Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, again, I just wanted to highlight that. The Prairie Pest Monitoring Network actually puts out a weekly update. So they do a weather synopsis. Um, they talk about wind trajectories for a lot, some of our insect pests that are blown in uh, each year. Um, they also discuss um, or they also have uh, models in which they can look at development and insect development. And so recently they've been running the models for grasshopper development. Um, and so the eggs are, have been uh, increasing in development, although late last week uh, with the cold wet weather, they kind of were a bit of a, a, of a plateau. Um, but they had this every week, they put this out. And so you can follow these models and you can look at how far things have developed and where they could be at and potentially um, emerging. Um, they do it for, you know, things like alfalfa weevil development, um, grasshoppers, a, a wheat midge, um, and a few other species. So it's definitely a good thing to, to check out. Um, and if you just subscribe to the weekly update email, you'll, get, you'll just get that every week, a nice little uh, synopsis of what's, what's going on weather-wise and what insect pests to watch out for. Uh, and it's very timely throughout the growing season. Um, another thing to draw your attention to is uh, Field Heroes, which is a, a campaign to really learn more about the beneficial insects that are in your crop. Um, and if you go to their website, they also have resources on how to scout. 
uh, for different uh, insect pests, as well as the potential beneficial insects that are going to be predating on those pests. Um, and they also highlight uh, research that's being conducted on those beneficial insects. So definitely um, have a look there. And of course, in all of our in all of our prairie provinces, uh, the provincial governments uh, have have good resources available. So in Saskatchewan, um, they don't have live maps, but they do have kind of weekly updates based off of um, trap capture for different insects. So you can go onto the website uh, and you can see uh, dimeback moth uh, numbers from last week. And they also have really good information that's relevant to Alberta in terms of you know monitoring for different species and um, things like potential misidentifications, uh, and control options, et cetera. Manitoba also has, does a very similar thing. Um, John Kowalski also has kind of a weekly update email throughout the growing season. Um, and they also, again, have a lot of information on insect pests that are relevant um, here in Alberta. And then finally, uh, if you have some bug-related questions, you can always uh, hit up Alberta Bug Chat, which is Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. throughout the growing season. Um, and it used to be headed up, of course, by Scott Mears. Uh, now, uh, Shelley and some of the uh, um, extension staff and agronomists at our commissions are helping to uh, guide us entomologists. And so each week they've kind of have a number of entomologists who can chime in and answer your questions um, if you have any. Um, so with that, went a little longer than expected, but I just want to acknowledge, of course, my, uh, my current employer, the University of Alberta, uh, collaborators at Alberta, of course, the government of Alberta, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, and of course, uh, the commissions here in Alberta who, uh, who do great work and also who uh, are helping to fund my research. Okay. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, try to answer your questions. And if you want to get in touch later on, there's my contact information. Wonderful, Boyd. That was great. Thank you for all of that information. We do have uh, one question right, right away here from uh, Jeremy Symes. Actually, um, maybe we'll go to, uh, to Dave here. He's popped in. Dave, I think you had a, a question there. Yeah, it's regarding grasshopper scouting and that. Uh, I'm down here in southern Alberta, and we've always had grasshoppers and that. And what is the best time to be scouting and at what stage to determine if you're going to have an issue later on in the season? Is there any particular time we should be really looking? Um, kind of the earlier in the season, the better. Um, if you can control them when they're younger and the smaller instars, um, that's the better time. There are thresholds available. I don't remember them off the top of my head. Um, but if you check the, the Blue Book or the Alberta website, um, they'll be up there for you. So sorry, I can't be more specific than that. Yeah, and maybe a follow-up, like uh, we're having wet weather here down here mm -hmm. today. And in a, say a month from now, we have wet weather when they're more in the, out in the nymph stages, it seems, does that help control them also? Yes, definitely. Um, what we find, well, what we find is that the the later in, the later nymphs are more hardy, um, so wet weather doesn't have as big of an impact on them. Uh, but you definitely, if if we get a hatch and they're still very young, um, the wet weather can impact them. At least a lot more fungal diseases that can reduce the population. Thank you. You're welcome. Last year, I guess, following up on grasshoppers, last year I got the question about, well, you know, we still had issues uh, in the Peace region uh, with grasshoppers, even though it was cold and wet. But that cold and wet weather happened later in the summer once the grasshoppers had already had time to, to hatch and do a lot of their development. Um, and so we still had issues with that. So it's, if it's earlier in the season, it really helps. And of course, of course the colder and wetter weather also slows down um, their development and will even slow their slow their eating. So we have another question here from from Jeremy Symes. Uh, so thanks for the webinar. Just wondering why producers should be currently watching for cutworms and wireworms. Is there a growing concern uh, or something that should be routinely done this time of year? Thanks. 
Yeah, I would say it should be routinely done this time of year. Um, cutworm populations are, are fairly sporadic. Um, they, and it, you know, it really depends on where the females laid eggs or the, the previous year. Um, wire worms, we've, we, they, ha this is a good question for Haley, but they've been on the increase lately. Um, we've lost some of our, our, um, uh, our insecticides that actually used to kill wireworms and now are currently available ones only suppress them. Um, and so they, their populations do seem to be on the increase. Um, and as I mentioned, hopefully in the future, uh, we'll have a, a few products that will actually, um, actually kill them again. But definitely this time of year, we should, we should be scouting for these um, early on. So I, I, allowed Haley to, to talk. If she wants to unmute herself and make any comments, um, we'd be happy to take any comments from the wireworm expert if she's, if she's there. <clears throat> oh, she just, she just wrote. Yeah, wireworms and cutworms have different treatments, so it's important to know what is causing the patches, yeah. Um, and I, yeah, totally back that comment up. I agree. Um, so you need to really find out what is causing that, that patch in your field. Yeah. I am, I am muted. Her, so oh, there she is. Uh, yeah. I was just writing that. Um, if you, if you have patchiness in your field, it's important to know the cause because, because of the different treatments, right? Like there are some foliar chemical treatments for cutworms, um, but not for wireworms. So if you're spraying, thinking you have cutworms, but you don't, then you're wiping out a bunch of beneficial insects um, without solving your problem. So it's really important. This is the time of year you can catch these pests red-handed because later on in, in, you know, as the summer goes on, you won't catch them. The wireworms will be down deeper in the soil. Um, the cutworms may have moved on to their next life stage. Uh, so if you see those patches, now's the time to catch those pests red-handed. So you know next year what, what problem you're dealing with. Yeah, especially, yeah, for wireworms, because we don't have any in-season control methods. Um, and then you may want to think about a seed treatment for the following year in those, uh, in those fields. So we, there's two things. One, uh, I want to make a comment, and there's another question that came up, and, and um, both of them, Haley can jump in, but feel free for both of you to have a conversation about this. But um, the question that came in was from Madison Boone. Is it beneficial to put out wireworm bait traps? And then my comment was, Haley, um, do you want to make any comments on the upcoming control um, options that may be available from, from, for wireworm? Okay, so uh, two-part question, I guess. The first one about wireworm bait traps. Um, those are really the most, most effective before seeding because wireworms are attracted to carbon dioxide producing things in the soil. So before seeding, if you put a bait trap in, um, that trap will produce CO2 and the wireworms will come to it, right? But after seeding, your field is full of seeds that are all producing CO2, um, so the wireworms won't be attracted to your traps. So it's not effective to bait trap uh, after seeding. So the best time to survey for wireworms, survey your field is before seeding in the spring. Uh, second question, what was it? Oh, upcoming control methods. I, I'm assuming you mean chemicals, right? Right, seed yeah. treatments? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so up till recently, well, okay, I should say in 2004, up till 2004, we had an effective seed treatment um, called Lindane. Uh, but it's since been deregistered due to toxicity concerns. So from 2004 until this year, we've only had neonicotinoid seed treatments, and they've been shown to be, um, uh, they will subdue wireworms for several weeks, allowing a crop to get established, but it won't kill them. Um, so the populations were remaining high and even growing with neonic seed treatments. Uh, this year, there's a new seed treatment registered in group 28, Lumivia CPL. And uh, it's, I haven't seen data that shows that it kills wireworms, but it's a new mode of action to get crop protection. Uh, the new chemical that is claiming to kill wireworms is brothlanolide, which is supposed to be out next year if all goes well. And if it really does kill wireworms, then we're talking about a game changer um, in terms of actually reducing populations. Wonderful. So Charmaine uh, Mendez just asked about uh, product uh, 
chlorantranilaprole. Yeah, is that's the that group chlorine. Those that you just mentioned, <laughs> I butchered that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know those are hard words to say for sure. No, that's the group 28, uh, the, um, uh, what is it, Lumivia CPL. That's oh. already out this year. And the CPL is cereal pulses, and I think they, the L is lentils, and it's a treatment for wireworms and cutworms. So it's, that's one of the few times where you can treat both with the same uh, treatment. And it is killing the wireworms and cutworms by disrupting their ability to feed. Well, we don't know if Lumivia CPL is killing wireworms. And some of the data shows that it's not. The one that is claiming to kill them is going to be out next year, uh, which is broflanolide, which is a whole new mode of action, uh, group 30. Okay. I've been studying my blue book lately. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, thanks, Haley. I have a yeah, question thanks. here from the Q and A, and I think um, well, we still have a bit of time. So this is from Brian Tybin, actually. Uh, she said you mentioned wheat midge development is dependent on moisture in the spring. Have we had enough moisture, or is there still time for the moisture to come and let them develop? Yeah, there will always be some wheat midge developing. Um, in May, I think the models show it's supposed to be about 25 millimeters of, of rain in May that really um, ramps them up. Uh, have we had enough? I can't recall on how much moisture we've had. I would say most areas probably not. Um, but we'd have to, you'd have to look uh, on, uh, on a local scale to see, to see what's going on there. Thanks, Boyd. I would say um, <clears throat> for anyone looking for local data on rainfall, um, ACIS, uh, so that's A-C-I-S, I'm not going to remember what the full, what that full acronym represents, Alberta Climate, Climate Information, Service. Information System. So if you search that on Google, um, you can actually uh, pinpoint one of the 300 weather stations across Alberta and then look at whether that it's tracked day by day, hour by hour for as long, as far back as you want to go. Um, so if you're worried about a specific region, um, pick the, the weather station in that region um, and then pick the, the, the date ranges in May and see whether you're getting close to that 25 mils. And then that should give you an idea of whether you're in that threshold or not. Um, do you agree, Boyd, with that? Yeah, that sounds great. There's a non-bug related question, Boyd, and I don't want to upset any entomologists. Heaven forget, heaven forbid, somebody call a lady beetle a ladybug. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, somebody can. Last year there was a lot of problems with slugs, which are not mm. bugs. Yes. yes. Um, is there any forecast on? slug populations this year because it was bad last year and we went into the fall with a pretty wet uh, situation yeah i Anybody have track them to put it to put it frankly i have no idea um generally our wetter years is where we do yeah have slug issues um but in as far as i'm aware here on the prairies no one is tracking them or uh yeah following their populations at least as far as the entomologists are are concerned um yeah as far as you know what's going to happen this year i don't know i think it's going to be very weather dependent again um and we'll just have to see because we had high slug populations last year you know if we do have another wet um year i would i would wager that we probably have slug issues again this year the question is boy is even if even if we could forecast and say yes high populations were high last year we went into the fall with high moisture we're expecting high populations next year is there anything any producer can do if they're seeing high amounts of of slugs in their field uh no <laughs> uh, so insecticides are are ineffective uh against slugs um, 
they aren't they aren't insects. They uh, they don't react the same way to insecticides. There are some molluscicides, um, if I'm even saying that right, that are available in the United States. Um, I don't think there are any available uh, in Canada. Um, and so, yes, we don't have any uh, control options for slugs. Some salt and uh, waste some beer on them, but that's about it. So start mixing your, your salt tanks now, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> salt your fields. Mm. <laughs> No. I wouldn't I, recommend it. <laughs> I think we've covered all of the questions. Uh, if anyone has any last minute questions, throw them in now. Um, otherwise, again, Boyd, thank you so much for the time. Um, this has been very informative. Uh, thank you for everyone who came and attended and asked questions. Um, it's great to get this information out there, um, help the industry um, walk this, this out to producers and, and have these conversations. So um, thanks to everyone. Um, yes thank and, you yeah and we'll we'll see you next week hopefully all right